Birchbark House, Chapter 9. And we are officially in Bibboon, which is winter. As we look at this page, we see snow everywhere. Um, it looks like a lot of snow um, on the roof piled up over the side of the house. So we can infer that it is very, very cold and has snowed a lot. Chapter nine, the blue ferns. Snow filled the world, falling deeper and deeper, changing the island. The cabin was made in the Chamukaman way. Dede was proud of its snug construction with thick logs fitted together as closely as possible. The heaviest mud he could find, the stickiest clay, Dede tamped between the logs to seal the cracks. He'd put cross beams up top and split logs to make a tiny loft where Omakias, Angeline, and Pinch slept on their woven reed mats placed over tufts of moss. Grandma still slept at the coldest end of the loft, only now in her thick rabbit fur blanket. Cold crept along the floor. Omakias was glad of the boring time she'd spent over the summer pressing fistfuls of gumbo clay taken from the center of the island into those places where the dried mud had crumbled. The warmest places in the house were on the sides she had mended best. Cold air sneaked in just where she'd run out of muck and had to use grass. Sometimes the wind whistled when it entered. That thin whine sent a shiver down her back. Now that Dede was home, the cabin changed too. Filled with his traps and blankets, his big man's coat and head wrap, his moose hide mitts and traveling kettles, ice chisels, axe, his moccasins old again within mama's embrace, and his new gun secure on pegs over the door, the cabin seemed smaller and cozier, in a way more interesting, Omakias thought, and more difficult too. So their cabin is built in the manner of the way of the white man, and we know that um, Day Day is half white. Um, so he did take some of their ways and use them. And Omakias is glad that she worked hard, that she did her chores. It's helping keep some of the cold out of the cabin. Um, it is a very, very cold winter. And the first part of this chapter that we just finished is primarily spent describing the setting, the cabin, um, what it's like, how it's constructed, how cold it is outside. And then we get the paragraph saying, now that Dede was home, it's different because now all his stuff is there. So it's busier, it's more full, there's a lot more stuff there, but that makes it feel cozier to her. Her family is here um, and it makes it a little bit more interesting. But then she says it makes it more difficult too. And that's what I'm wondering is why would this be more difficult with Dede home? People stopped in at any time of day or even in the deep of night, and these visitors required constant attention. Yellow Kettle and Grandma were known as the keepers of a good store of food and a warm fire, although Omakias, Angeline, and Pinch were the ones responsible for hauling the water for tea and chopping the wood for the fire that burned in the proud little hearth. The fires needed constant vigilance, as did family needs. Dede's gun required his concentrated care, and he liked tea at his elbow while he cleaned the workings in barrel. It seems to Amakias that every time the grown-ups began to talk, they discussed travel routes west. They argued whether the pressure of so many newcomers was going to send them the way so many others were sent, into the territory of the Buanu, the Dakota. There was now constant talk of government intentions, plans to meet in council, invitations to smoke the pipe. At least there were less serious visitors, including Two Strike Girl, Wish Cobb, and Auntie Muskrat, Twilight, and Little Bee. Angeline's favorite friend, young Tin Snow, came by to visit almost every day. Albert Lepatre came early to tell his dreams to Dede, who tried to take them seriously. So Machias also says that people are always coming in and out. They're always having visitors um, that require attention. 
and Yellow Kettle and Grandma were known as the keepers of a good store of food and a warm fire. So Ahmad Kass's mom and grandma are almost kind of the caretakers. Like everybody knows that they're gonna have food and a warm fire. So they go there for comfort, to grab a bite to eat, to um, just spiritually help make it through the winter. Um, there are still a lot of chores. And then Amakia says that the grown-ups are consistently talking more about going west. And we know from a previous chapter that that's already been discussed, that the white men are continuing to push them out and they're going further and further west um, because they're being pushed out of land. And then um, also, of course, their friends come by and Albert Lepatre, the guy with the dream, comes to tell his dreams to Day Day. And it says Day Day tries to take them seriously because we know with the first one, he was trying not to laugh. Last night, I dreamed my head got stuck in a kettle. He revealed his voice low and troubled. It must have been a very big kettle, Day Day said solemnly, for Lepatre had a big round head and a full moon face. Good jet, said Lepatre. He never understood teasing jokes. It was big. Even so, what does it mean? Some dreams are so powerful, they are beyond our humble ability to comprehend, said Dede. Le Patre leaned back, satisfied. Only Mama caught Dede's wink. Even Otello stopped over to eat whatever she was given often standing outside the door and bolting soup before she hurried off to hunt. And yes, she had now donned her coat. The coat of old tallow was a fantastic thing, woven of various pelts, including one of lynx, one of beaver, a deer hide, and two that belonged to beloved dogs. She had pieced together old blankets, one a faded red, one brown, Discarded shreds of unidentifiable stuffs were sewed patch on patch, including some black beaded velvets and bright calicos. The coat fit across her in a great mound and flapped when she moved. She wore it well, springing lightly along like a huge tattered bear. No cold seemed to bother old Tallow, but if it was too biting a day to walk outside or slide on the ice, Tin Snow and Angeline sat in the corner of the cabin on bedrolls and piles of skins. There, light from the window of thick oiled paper falling golden on their faces, the two young women sewed and talked. Tin Snow had finished something very impressive, much admired by the other women, including Grandma, who took it in her hands and blessed it one cold day. It was a bag for fishtail, a fashionable bandolier bag. Instead of the dyed quills Grandma used so skillfully, Tin Snow had sewn the bag with trade beads bought in precious packets at the company store. And here we see an illustration of Otello and showing her coat. And we know that her coat is made of whatever kind of scraps and fabric and pelts that she can find. It's like she just keeps adding on. Um, as she gets stuff, we know that they're very resourceful um, and two of her dogs with her. The bag was covered with four beaver skins worth of white beads. And they were expensive. Fishtail's square bag was beaded all over in swirls of green vines, leaves, and glowing crimson flowers that popped out vividly against the white beads of the background. The shoulder strap, too, was entirely beaded. The strap's design was simple, unusual, and consisted of blue curls that Tin Snow bashfully explained were the uncoiled heads of new spring ferns, her husband's favorite food. Looking at it, Amakias had to blink her eyes, for the beads were so perfect and the repeated, the repeated pattern so compelling that the ferns seemed to move like little waves. Will you teach me how to bead that pattern? Angeline asked her friend. Ah, yeah. Tin Snow removed from her little sewing kit and needle, and Angeline took out her own work, her own beads, bought with dried whitefish. They began. 
Gay Neen, said Omakias. Me too. Tin Snow smiled gently, and Angeline looked at her little sister in surprise. You? She grinned. Little frog, little jumper, can you sit still that long? Stung by her sister's amused tone of voice, Omakias dropped her head to her chest, eyes squinting narrow. A huge space opened up in her head, black and rushing as a freezing winter stream. She was old enough to tan the stinking old hides, wasn't she? Her work was valued there, wasn't it? Why shouldn't she be trusted to use the precious beads? She was eight winters now. She wasn't that little. She could chop wood, haul the water from the hole Nokomis kept open in the ice with an ax and a long, sharp pole. Why couldn't she be like the older girls? So here we're still seeing a little bit of that resentment and that envy um, between the sisters. I feel like Angeline was probably lightly teasing, but because of that kind of old resentment and jealousy, Omakias, it really hurts her feelings and really upsets her. Angeline laughed out loud. Omakias turned away. Her heart shrunk cold in her chest, tiny but heavy as a lake rock. How her sister's words could stab her sometimes. But now, as though she hadn't noticed Angeline's remark at all, Tin Snow's hand was stroking Amakias's arm, and she was speaking. Shh, Ishte, little sister, I made something for you. Into Amakias's hands, she placed a small leather packet. Amakias looked up at Tin Snow, uncertain. Yes, for you. Tin Snow gestured for her to open it, and slowly, with unbelieving delight, Amakias did. The leather packet was lined with broadcloth, and into the cloth, two needles were stuck. Two! Around a peeled twig, Tin Snow had wound a long length of the finest sinew thread to use in beading. At the end of the cloth, a small pocket held a lump of fragrant, summery yellow beeswax to use in strengthening the sinew thread. And best of all, she saw, as Tin Snow lifted up the dark blue strip of cloth, there was a tiny sack of all colors of beads, seed beads, the little grown up kind of beads, shining and gleaming against the cloth. Manadominins, they were called, little spirit seeds. So Angeline's kind of picking at her sister, still sees her as very, very young, but Angeline's best friend, Tin Snow, seemed almost to recognize Amakias's desire to be treated more as one of the older girls and she had made her a gift that was appropriate for an older girl. Megwetch, Megwetch, Megwetch. Amakias thanked Tin Snow over and over again until the older girl couldn't help smiling. The youngest of her family, Tin Snow had no little sisters and as yet no children. So she was extra kind to Amakias. As the older girls returned to their work and their talk, Amakias curled near the fire to look at her beads and to imagine what she would make with them. At first, she thought that she might bead some tiny moccasins for her dolls. Then she thought Angeline might make fun of her project. Mama? Something for Mama? She had so many quilled things and preferred them. Besides, Grandma was always making a box or an ornament for her. How about for Grandma, for Day Day, for Angeline? Certainly not for Pinch, who would spoil anything he got. Or Niwo, who might chew off the beads. Niwo. Suddenly she knew, as though the beads had told her themselves, that they were meant for her little brother. Um, Akias would make something very special for him. She saw what she would make coming clear. Moccasins, warm moccasins trimmed with rabbit fur. In her mind, she planned them out, sewn from scraps of moose hide that were left over from the summer. She saw them with white flowers beaded on the ankles, woolen balls of blanket thread to decorate the cuffs. Admiring her idea, gloating, planning, Amakias turned the leather sewing kit and bead packet over and over in her hands. 
Mama and Grandma set their work out on blankets before them. Grandma was completing the edge of a great round box of birch bark, one that she would use to store her red willow knick-knick. She was binding the edges with strips of basswood bark and sinew. She had cut fancy shapes of stars out to sew on the sides. Mama had set aside Day-Day's fancy moose hide coat jacket in order to finish Angeline's fine clothing to wear at the gathering dance that would be held as soon as a few more families had set up their winter households. Grandma, meanwhile, had finished a beautiful dance fan made of a partridge tail. Its handle was birch bark bound tightly and quilled with sweet flowers. The thimbles that Mama was sewing onto Angeline's shawl caught orange specks of fire as Mama worked each one onto the wide strip of ribbon. First, she punched a little hole in the tip of the thimble with her awl. Then she threaded a bit of red cord through, knotted the end well inside the thimble, and sewed the end of the cord underneath the ribbon so it didn't show. As soon as she took the last stitch, Angeline clapped her hands. Let me try it on, cried Angeline impatiently. Laughing, Mama handed it to her and beautiful Angeline wrapped herself in its fine swirl. Grandma handed her the dance fan, everyone admired. Mama, said Omakias, can you help me now? Aye, aye, gijet, Mama said. They left off looking at Angeline and started work on Niwo's moccasins. From the moose hide left over from Dede's moccasins, Mama helped Omakias cut out a pair of moccasins for Niwo winter moccasins with cuffs well up his legs for warmth. Amakias planned out a flower and began immediately, imitating Mama, to sew the beads into the design. It was harder, more exacting work than she thought. The sinew tangled and knotted, beads bounced off the needle's tip. Even when she fastened the beads on, sometimes they looked odd or crooked, and she had to take them off. She put her needle down. Tears of frustration stung. Amakias was very, very excited um, to begin this project for Niwo. She felt like she was being accepted as, you know, older and more mature. But one thing I noticed, um, she was so excited with her plan and so proud of it that she just jumped in. She just jumped in and started. And of course, she struggled. Um, and that's part of learning. So just like we talk about how it's a process to learn in school and learn new things, it's a process whenever you're learning anything and Amakias is finding that out. Um, she's got to practice, she's got to learn, she's got to get better, mistakes are being made and um, it's very, very frustrating for her.